Hi everybody, welcome to this new Capture One session in collaboration with WEX. Thank you all for signing up with us today. And thanks of course to WEX and to Tiffany at WEX for hosting us again. So um, today it's the 9th of December and we are super excited because we just launched Capture One 22 literally 30 minutes ago. So we just welcome it um, to uh, the Capture One environment. And the reason why we decided to do this, cap this live session right now is just to show you around what's new. Um, it's a very, very exciting release for us because um, basically we've just added our top two most requested features in the history of Capture One, which is uh, Panorama Merge and Panorama Stitching and HDR Merge. So we hope that you're going to enjoy these new features uh, just as much as we enjoyed creating them for you. So let's talk about what this session is going to be like. Um, this is not going to take a super long time because I, um, I will walk you around everything, but we won't dive like super, super deep into anything because it's just the purpose is just to basically show you around. So you have a general idea what it's like and how to use the new features. And then if you're interested in the future, maybe we can schedule more sessions because maybe what interests you most is Panorama Merge. So that maybe we can just do a really dedicated session to Panorama because there is a lot into it. So I will just cover the basics today. I don't want to overwhelm you so much. Um, this whole walkthrough will take us around 30 minutes and then I will leave around 10 minutes in the end for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, don't hold back. Um, they can be related to Capture 122 or the new features and they can be more generic uh, Capture One questions, that's fine. And I'll have someone just um, read me the, your questions. Um, and yeah, uh, I will take a look at them from time to time. And if not, you can just hold them until the end of the webinar. So. Um, we have a busy schedule today. Let's just jump right into the interface and let's see what's going on. There you go. So this is the Capture One 22 interface. As you can see in the terms of interface, not much has changed. Um, not at all, actually. There is just one little interface change, which is like hidden in a sub menu, but I think it's, uh, it's still an important tweak for usability. So here in the filter area, uh, you can see that by default we have, as always, rating, color tag, date and keywords. So the new thing here is that if you press on this new plus icon, you're going to have the possibility to show or hide different metadata filters. So for example, let's say I never use a keywords, so I can remove that one and have a cleaner interface. Uh, maybe the date I want to keep, maybe I want to see which of the photos were exported or not. So now, whoopsie, that's going to just show in the interface, right? So if I click on the no, uh, I will only get not exported photos showing up and I can just use that as any other filter. You can see if you take a look here, there is just many, many filters based on IPTC metadata, any vendor specific metadata. So there is a lot that you can do here in, for organizing your catalog. And talking about catalogs, um, there's also changes to performance and improvement in, a, in the performance in catalogs, especially in Windows. This one is going to be more for the Windows users. Um, in Mac, there is not so many changes, but in Windows, it's really noticeable. So if for, those, for all of those uh, Windows users out there, please go ahead and try it. Um, also talking about trial, um, remember for those of you who have already tested Capture One in the previous versions, could be 21 or could be 20 or any other previous version of Capture One, Remember that with every release, the trial countdown goes back to zero. That means that right now you can just go ahead into CaptureOne.com and download a new um, trial for 30 days and try the new features in Capture One 22 and see how you like that. Um, I was I'm going to get probably some questions about um, how to get the new version and stuff like that. Remember that uh, this is a webinar in collaboration with Wix, so you can just go ahead right now to Wix website and purchase a new version if you would like to do that. Okay, so this is just an introduction. Also here in the Learn Hub you have the new tutorials for all the new features, so if you want to get a little bit more into depth with that, don't hesitate, go into the Learn Hub, go into our YouTube channel where my colleague David Grover will also cover the features, and if you want to learn it a little bit more in detail, then uh, you can very much do that. Okay. So let's go right into business, into the really, really cool features of Capture One 22. For that, I'm going to share my camera for a little while. I'll see you again in the end of the webinar. Okay, now that we are alone here, uh, let's just see how we use these new features. If you like, let's start with HDR. 
Okay, so basically, first of all, what is an HDR? Okay, because this is, requires some explanation and I'm actually going to go back for a little bit, so it's like more dynamic, so uh, you don't have to look at my blank screen. Um, so HDR Merge is a feature where we can just combine different shots uh, with different exposures to create a DNG file uh, that behaves just like a RAW file that will um, include the um, data that was capturing the different shots to create like one huge RAW file with a lot of information in it. So for scenes like this one, so here we have a huge high dynamic range in the photo, so we have really, really bright highlights. We need to make sure that they're not burned when we are capturing them. And on the other side here, we have a lot of things in the shadows. So we have a lot of texture, a lot of things going on in here. And uh, this feature is for those of you who are landscape shooters and that you don't want to miss out any of this nice detail in your photo. So basically, by shooting these two photos together in the same time, um, um, ideally with a tripod, uh, you can get all of the information just divided into different shots. So right now with Capture One, what we can do is just merge these two shots to get like a super huge DNG file that will allow us to have all of the detail. And then uh, after we merge it, we can just keep edit editing it just as if it was any um, standard RAW file. Right. So for HDR merge, it's important that um, you do your shots right. So you cannot just merge any shots. Um, basically, it has to be the same scene, uh, it has to be as much aligned as possible, uh, even though there is an auto-align feature, but we do recommend that you shoot on tripod if you can. Um, normally, we would do three images, um, but it also works with two or with more images, but ideally we would do three. For today, I'm going to demo with two because it's like really well shot, uh, but ideally you would take three of them with a difference or more or less two f-stops from one shot to another. Um, but this is really well shot. This is uh, some images from a Spanish photographer who is really, really uh, expert in HDR merge and panorama stitching. He's called Jose Maria Mellado. And if you want to, if you like this kind of super uh, deep landscape photography, I do recommend you check him out because his work is great. So thanks Jose Maria for borrowing us these photos for today. So yeah, we're going to do an HDR merge of these two photos and then maybe you can understand better what it's like. So let's just go back to the screen. There you go. So now we have these two photos. Uh, we got them both selected. And let's see how this tool works like. So once we have selected the two photos that we want to combine, let's just right click on any of them. And we'll get this drop down menu. And here uh, there is two new options, merge to HDR and stitch to panorama, which we'll be talking about in a minute. For now, let's just choose merge to HDR. And we're going to get this little uh, pop-up window with only two options. So really easy, no words with lost. Uh, we have the auto align feature that I was talking about. This we would choose if we are not shooting on a tripod and then well, if we're shot on a tripod, we can also keep it. There's not going to be any effect or any downside to it. And then the auto adjust feature. Um, this is basically if we want the final HDR uh, DNG file merged to have some auto adjustments included. Uh, these auto adjustments include things like exposure, brightness, uh, high dynamic range, and stuff like that. So um, these are just standard capture one adjustments. It means that if we don't like the final result, we can always, as with any other RAW file, reset the adjustments and go back to doing our own thing. So for now, I'm just going to keep it on and let's just click on merge. Okay, so now we're going to have this little um, activity bar here. How long does it take to merge uh, an HDR shot? Um, so that's going to depend a lot on what gear we're using. So first of all, the camera that we're using, the resolution it has, the color depth, and also, of course, on the computer that we are using. Uh, you can see that for me, uh, it didn't take a long time. It took around, I'd say, eight to 10 seconds. So it can be like from five seconds to um, several minutes, depending on what we are using. If you are curious to know, I'm on a MacBook Pro 2020, um, M1. And there you go. If we activate notifications, we can just click on show. And basically you can see that there, it's just right underneath the shot. So this is the, what we merged. And this is the final uh, DNG linear file. So let's see what happens here. Um, let's just go into the adjustments. You can see that there's some things that were adjusted. 
So exposure, brightness, as I said, high dynamic range. And this is what we, this is because we just clicked on the auto adjust feature. If we hadn't clicked that, then we would just get a linear super standard DNG like this. So this would be like the pure uh, result of our merge. So what happens now with this file, it might look a little bit similar to this, but in the terms of how it behaves, uh, it's going to be very different. So let's just pull up the shadows completely and let's go recover some highlights completely. I know that this looks bad. Don't worry, it's not going to stay like that. I just wanted to use it as a proof of concept of what you can achieve. So let's just zoom a little bit here. Just going to click on full screen so you can better see what's happening. So basically here we have all detail. It's really bright, but if it's not burned. If you see here, it just took these adjustments from our, um, our photo with a lower light um, and nothing's burned here. It's really bright, but not burned at all. And then uh, we have really nice definition and detail all around. If we come back here to the darkest area of the photo, we can see that there is no artifacts. It's just really nice, really pure. And we have a lot of fine detail everywhere. So what would we do now with this raw file? Let's just reset it. Let's just de-zoom. Maybe I can just hide the tools over here so we can have a better view of what's going on. There you go. Okay. And now with this DNG file, as I said, it just behaves exactly like a standard raw file. So it means that we can do any adjustments that we like. I'm just going to very quickly do some adjustments here. Just going to go down on exposure a little bit and on brightness to give it a little bit a little bit more of depth. I'm going to apply a simple S-shaped curve, some clarity. Maybe I need to recover a little bit more of the shadows. It's just about playing with the adjustments we already know. And maybe some dehaze. All right, I think that's looking good. Some extra saturation maybe. And then we can just play around with the white balance. Just, you can see that it's exactly just like a raw file and we would treat it as any other raw file. I think the white balance was okay as it was actually. Let me just do it a little bit not so green. And there you go. This is our final HDR merged file with a lot of information. I'm sorry about that. Okay, it's gone. All right. So this will be the way to do an HDR merge. So I know it uh, in Capture One it looks very easy, but keep in mind what I told you before, you need to shoot this mindfully. So better with a tripod, do um, ideally three images with a uh, difference of two f-stops between one and another. And just be patient if it's not instantaneous emerge, because as I said, it can the results can vary a little bit from one computer to the other. So that's a very simple one. So let's go and see uh, what's happening with the panorama stitching. Uh, going back to my library here, I've got another folder full of some panorama examples. So I have different examples to show you. Uh, I will just choose one. So I have like the little sunflower field around here. This one I really like, I think I will go for this one. It's like this log in the side of the river. And then we also have some Alp mountains. Okay, I think I'm going to go for the log because it's really nice and clean. So these are the four photos uh, composing my panorama stitching, um, but you can really use as many as you like. There is no limit to it. The only limit would be the maximum um, size of the output file and resolution and the maximum pixel size, uh, but it's really, really uh, high. We'll talk about it in a second. So um, I'm just going to reshare my camera for a little moment because I need to talk to camera and explain you what this whole thing is about. Same as I did with the HDR because I don't want to assume that uh, everyone knows exactly what we're talking about here. So. Um, in the HDR merge feature, the objective, the final goal of this is to shoot the same, exactly the same scene with different exposures to combine this into one shot that will be virtually the same, but with more information. Uh, the panorama stitching is a little bit different. So what we're trying to do here is combine different shots uh, from the same scene, but that was shot uh, with different perspectives or different parts of the image were shot differently. And like this, we can, what we can do, we can get a really wide, uh, huge file with a lot of information also. 
but in the matters of space. So we can combine different shots and we can capture huge scenes uh, without the need of using a wide angle um, with all the benefits that it has. So for example, no warping, um, no vignette, for example. Um, you can you know that a lot of uh, wide angle lenses can get really distorted. So that is an effect that we might not be into and we, want, we might want to try to capture a whole huge scene without the need of having this warped um, distorted corners. So this is what Panorama Merge allows us to do. So let's see an example. So for example here, going back to my screen, I'm going to go full screen here. I have these different shots from this uh, little log. So you can see what I did. So from left to right, I was just shooting different parts of this scene and we're going to just merge them into one. So also like the with the HDR, we need to be mindful of what we are shooting and how. So some recommendations that we're giving you is um, for shooting uh, this kind of panorama stitching, you should be using a lens that is 35 millimeters or longer. Ideally, you can also do it on a tripod, but in this case, I didn't do it on a tripod. So that also works. I just was like rotating my hip, if that is a um, tip that works for you. Very important, you should lock exposure and focus because if it's not exactly the same exposure and if the focus is not in the same place, it's not going to stitch correctly. And it's important that between each shot, you leave around uh, from 20 to 40% overlap, ideally. So Capture One then has some information of what to merge where. Um, and yeah, let's see what the interface looks like. So same as with the HDR merge, we just selected the four files that are into the panorama. Before doing the proper stitching, uh, we can also adjust it into Capture One. We could just do it before or after the stitching because as you heard before, the DNG file behaves like a raw file. But just in case, uh, we might want to, whoopsie. Okay. We might want to just do it now. So I'm just going to do very simple speed edit adjustments. If you remember speed edit is what you like, tap these keys that correspond to the um, um, basic features in Capture One and then you can use them to edit in ROS and it's really, really nice. So I'm just going to go full screen again. I really like using this feature in next to the, um, uh, with the full screen on because it allows me to see a lot of what's happening. So I can um, correct shadows and I can bring back some highlights. We don't want to overdo it, but we want to be able to keep nice detail and everywhere while keeping a nice contrast. So I'm just go also going to apply some clarity. Uh, let's play around with the levels a little bit. If you see what I'm doing, you don't see my hands right now, but what I'm doing is just pressing and holding. So for example, I know that for the black point in the levels, the X is the shortcut. And then if I want to lift up, for example, the brightness, that's going to be the letter E. So if I press and hold E in my keyboard, and then I just go right, uh, with my Wacom pen, that's going to uh, lift up the brightness. If I go left, that's going to reduce it. Uh, I'm using a Wacom tablet, but um, in this case, I'm just going to use it like that, but it also works with mouse and even with the keyboard, show. So it's for everyone. Um, I think that we quite set around here. Let's just lift up the shadow just a little bit more. And I'm going to warm this photo up just a little bit. So the Kelvin, the color temperature is number one. So I'm just going to warm it up a little bit. And two will be 10, so if I want to warm it up, it will be over to the right, to the magenta side of things. So I think that's a nice color. And now uh, that we did some basic adjustments, let's just go back to the interface and let's do the merge. So again, with four, all four photos selected, it's really important if you did any adjustments before that it's exactly the same for all the photos, so otherwise it won't work. And now, right click and next to the merge to, the merge to HDR option, we also have stitch to panorama. So we get this pop-up window. Um, if you can see here, there is not so many options again. Uh, in this case, we just need to choose a projection. So there is different projections for different purposes, for different types of shots. Uh, normally we would be using either the cylindrical or the spherical. It takes some seconds to generate the previews. Also, this is going to depend a lot on the resolution of your photos and on the features of your computer that you're using for this. Um, I won't cover deeply all the projections today. 
Uh, but just so you know, the spherical and cylindrical will be the most common to use. Uh, the spherical is the most cylindric one. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the spherical is the, mod, is the most common one. The cylindrical um, would be normally four shots that are covering more than 100 degrees. And the idea behind this is that the vertical lines won't be distorted and there might be some distortion here in, up in the corners, but the vertical lines will theoretically stay vertical. Then we have the perspective one. Um, this goes a little bit different. You can see also the little um, scheme next to the um, next to the name of the feature. This will be more thought, for example, for cityscapes or where, where you have a point where all the lines are merging. This will be more um, better for that. And also the Panini is more thought for architectural shots, so I know it's, it won't work. So I'm going to go either for the spherical or the cylindrical one in this case. Um, I'm going to choose, I think, the cylindrical one, which gives me a little bit more room to play around with the size of the image. So once I ch I've chosen my projection, I just have to choose my stitch size. We have, of course, the possibility to do a 100% uh, scale stitch. That would just be literally stitching all of the photos together as they are. But keep in mind that this can result in huge files. So this is not a really, really huge file, okay? Um, this is uh, from a Fuji XS10, so it's not a huge uh, resolution camera, um, but it can still get pretty wide. So 12,000 pixels on the horizontal, um, and we might not want to do that, and also it's going to take longer, so for this case I'm just going to do 50%, and that's going to reduce both the size, you can have here an estimate of the size of your final file, and also an estimate size, so that's going to be half of it, that's going to be more manageable in also because when we are working with the file, it can get pretty slow if, uh, if it gets too huge. There is some maximum resolution um, limitations, so we are really, really far from it in this case. The maximum resolution that Capture One can handle for this will be 715 megapixels, so that's uh, a lot. Uh, but we don't normally would recommend going over 600 megapixels. If your final stitch will be over 600 megapixels, you might get a warning and saying, hey, this is going to be too huge. So you, are you sure you want to do this? Um, so then you can choose to reduce the scale a little bit. Also, the limitations in pixels, it's 65,000 uh, on each of the sides. So as again, we're really far from that. We're just going to click on stitch and see what happens. Also, we're going to get an activity. Whoop it. Okay, there is, that was pretty fast. It's done. So let's just go ahead and show. As before, it's just next to the, um, it's just next to the edited files. Uh, you might be noticing some difference in color. Uh, I actually forgot to mention this. For now, HDR and panorama stitching are not compatible with the Fujifilm film simulations, as this is a Fujifilm film simulation. And if we go back here, we can see that the curve is auto, so that would be probably a Provia simulation. So we might need to go back to the standard one and then you're going to notice difference in color. So this is why it doesn't look exactly the same in terms of color, but this is something really Fuji specific and we are already working on it. So if we go back to the standard, we should see now that there is not so many differences in color. Okay, so um, if we want to avoid this, it's just as easy as just not setting the, the Fujifilm simulations from the start, but um, as a standard, it comes in Provia, so I forgot to deset that, sorry about that. Then you can see that we have our file here, and even if it's a little bit different in terms of color, uh, detail-wise, it's really nice. Let's just go full screen. So, we have a really nice looking file. Let's just zoom in 100%. You can see we have nice detail everywhere. It's maybe a little bit decontrasted, but we can fix that really easily right now. There is no ghosts. Um, there could always be some ghosting, uh, like things that are not overlapping um, perfectly because of things moving or like trees moving or anything. Uh, in this case, uh, it's really fine. It solves all the conflicts pretty well. If you see any of these ghosting conflicts, you can just uh, heal them later on with a healing brush but it's not the case. Uh, everything looking, everything's looking pretty nice. So let's just go back and see how we can better edit this file. So I'm just going to hide this for a moment and we can add some contrast maybe or some extra curve. Okay, so let's add some curve. Let's recover a little bit more of the highlights. 
And there you go. And let's warm it up a little bit more. Okay, so that's looking nicer. We probably need to add also some clarity. And of course, uh, it's layer editable. So if we want to add anything like a linear gradient or something like that, that is always something that we can do. Remember, this file is fully editable into Capture One, just as if it was any other raw file, right? So this is a very generic edit, but I guess that works for now. If we want to work with color balance or something like that, we can also do it. Let's just go back to the background. Let's just cool down the shadows a little bit, maybe more towards the purple side of things. Let's warm up the highlights. That's probably a little bit too aggressive. You can also control a little bit more of the contrast from here. All right. So something like that. There you go. OK, so this is what we have now. Um, let's just see the before and after. Uh, I'm doing this with the shortcut letter Y. We can also do it in the dynamic mode. So this was the before. This was the after the merge. Um, and now the only th last thing to do is to crop. Um, so we have all of these uh, little um, black areas over here because, um, of course, it needs to respect the projection so not everything can be stitched um, perfectly. So it's up to us to now crop the final photo. We can do this uh, with any of the um, standard um, sizes that come into Capture One or we can just do this uh, as I did now in an unconstrained way, so we can basically create our own aspect ratio. So I like the panoramic shot, but it's like a little bit too wide. So let's just try to center the attention a little bit more into our important element here, which is the log. Let's try to get rid of the black framing, just like so. And that's looking great. Um, you can see that this was the result of photos uh, that were shot on 35 millimeters. So we have a really wide area covered without any distortion or without any uh, undesired vignettes and stuff like that. We can also do a little bit of a vignette if we want to. But that's just um, as far as you can take it and then just edit it like any other raw file that you have. I'm happy with this aspect ratio. I'm happy with color. It's a little bit melancholic. It looks nice in my opinion. So I'm just going to keep it like that. Um, and I think that will be it with the panorama demo. Um, just wanted to let you know that maybe uh, even if it's called a panorama stitching feature, don't you don't ne necessarily need to restrain yourself only to panorama because it can be used for multi row stitching. What do I mean with this? I better explain you with an example. So going back to my library, in the select folder here, I have this huge uh, raw file from our ambassador, Paul Reefer. Thanks, Paul, for uh, sharing with us this amazing shot. So if I show you where this comes from, this is a stitching of many different photos that were shot with a drone. Uh, you probably know the place already. Um, so basically, Paul was just shooting with his brand new drone um, all of these different shots uh, from Wormley Stadium and nearby, just having this perfect um area everything shot and everything's combined perfectly into this panorama this is huge um this is a 9000 um this is this was combined for all of these photos he probably applied some um uh percentage of resolution to not get like the huge thing because this can get really really huge uh but then you can see let's just zoom in 100 let's just walk around the photo a little bit it's just amazing what we can get to achieve with that. And then you can also play with focus and everything. So it's a really fantastic shot. Um, I can see there is some questions. I'll just get back to them in a second. There is just one last thing I wanted to explain you capture 122 wise, uh, some little last feature, and then I'll be right with you. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this example because I think it's amazing and I thought it in, I hope it inspired you a little bit to explore this feature because it can be really really interesting okay so uh, last feature that we have in capture 121 well actually not last but the other one I can't demonstrate I will just talk about it this is an auto rotate feature so I have selected here different shots different landscapes from random shooting days 
Um, and there is always a uh, kind of a pain when we are shooting landscapes and we have all of these different photos and our horizons are always tilting to one side or the other. And you know what I mean? And it's practically impossible that someone is shooting all of the landscape photos straight all the time. So the first thing that we would need to do is go over each shot and then just straightening up just like that. And then, yeah, you will do it one by one, which is really not fun, and really time consuming. So we decided why not make an auto rotate feature that works in batches and it's uh, working with artificial intelligence. So it will also learn from the way that you are shooting. So there you go. Uh, I selected all of them. The auto rotate feature, the new one, it's exactly where the last one used to be. So here in the lens and copying tool tab here in rotation and flip, we have a new uh, magic wand. If we click on this one, it will automatically adjust the rotation of all of our photos. So it didn't used to work in batches. Now it does. So let's just take a look at what it did. So yeah, that was nice. Let's see what it did here. It's really nice. Okay. That's looking great. In fact, yeah, it did a good job with most of the photos. Yeah. This one, for example, it was very visible how it's straightening everything up nicely. So yeah, you get the whole idea. Don't want to spend any more time here, but you get the whole idea and it's really much more time effective than just go one by one and rotate everything. And then you might get like a little bit obsessed with that. And then you rotate it and re-rotate it one side or the other. Or is that just me doing that? Maybe, I don't know, but yeah. Um, this will be like the last thing to demonstrate today. I hope you enjoyed the demos and I, I'm going to take your questions. So. There you go. Thanks for bearing with me. It's going to see your questions. Okay. Um, there was one about the output tab, one about the highlight shadows and midtones, which I guess you are referring to the color grading tool, the color balance. And Andreas, is it possible to auto crop the black areas of a panorama? So I will just start with the panorama thing because it's the one that we talked about the last. Uh, and Andreas, it's not possible currently to automatically crop out the black areas of the panorama. Um, I see your point, uh, but also think that sometimes you don't want to just have the whole panorama thing. You want to be able to recrop things onto up to your own liking. So this is maybe why we didn't prioritize this feature, but it's a nice feature request. And if you would like to see that, um, this is just like the first version of this tool. So there is, uh, of course, a huge room for improvement and a huge room for development here into this tool. So this is just the beginning. And if this is something that you would like to see implemented into the tool, uh, I, um, I, will, I, will, I will let you know the, um, the link to the forum for the feature request. So you can just request the feature there. Okay. So uh, I'm going over to Matt now because it would make sense like if we did the whole workflow to process at least one of the photos. Um, so the export tool tab, uh, it's something that was removed from the interface and it was simplified into this little export window. So let's just click in here and let's say I want to export my panorama. And here we have the different export recipes as we call them. The export recipes are basically um, presets for exporting. So we have different presets that already come within Capture One. So for example, this is an Instagram optimized, which is reducing size to 1080 pixels. Um, and this is why you can see that it's so small into the screen. So if I choose, for example, the JPEG full size, you can see that the preview is automatically updated with all of the information that goes in here. So for example, let's just choose um, the full size, highest quality and okay, why not? Let's do the Instagram optimized JPEG. And maybe we would also be able to do a TIFF or a PSD or whatever other format you like. Um, something cool into Capture One is that you can choose as many process recipes as you want to. Uh, so that means that you can get um, the file ready just in one click for different purposes. So let's just see what happens here, for example, into the JPEG full site. Um, we have something that is common to everyone, like location and naming. Yeah. Uh, this is all the only the collapse options. So just for your information, there is more advanced option here. So I'm just going to open it so you can see everything. There is a cross recipe tokens. This means that it would be um, used for all of the process recipes you're selecting. So for example, I'm just going to create a subfolder for all the process recipes. 
and I'm going to call them wax. And the folder that I'm going to set for output, that means where my exported files are going to be, I'm going to choose, choose them on the desktop. There you go. So by doing this, I'm making sure that um, the exported files will go into the desktop in a subfolder named WEX, which I think is really useful because I might not want a lot of different files just uh, hanging around my desktop just randomly, as we normally do. Okay, so desktop, um, then WEX, and I can even choose to have different subfolders within the same uh, recipe. So for example, uh, I might not want a JPEG for Instagram mixed up with the other JPEGs, so I'm just going to create a subfolder called Instagram. Um, naming wise, you don't need to touch anything. If you don't touch anything, it would just grab the naming from the raw file. If you want, you can also change the name, but you can just leave it as it is. On to the important things, format and size. So here you can customize every process recipe or basically create a whole new one from the scratch. So here for the Instagram, uh, we selected a JPEG, quality 80%, sRGB color space, and a scale that is limited to uh, 1080 pixels. We could change that, for example, if we want to be like 800 pixels or something like that, and you see that it's updated immediately in the preview. Meanwhile, for the full size JPEG, we have 100% quality. We also have sRGB because it's meant to be shown on screen. We could also choose Adobe RTB or any other ICC profile that we want to. And in this case, the scale will be 100%. This is why we have a huge file here. Uh, we have some options with sharpening and stuff like that that you need to use. We also have the option to add a watermark if that's something that you want to do. So for example, if I wanted to use my watermark, I could just type it here, my name, anything, play around with the scale and the location and whatnot. Or I could also like add an image like my own logo or anything like that. For today, I'm not going to apply any watermark. Some metadata instructions, what like what metadata we want embedded into the raw file. And just a summary that will let us know, like for example, things like estimated file size um, after output and things like that. So for example, you can see that for the Instagram optimize, we have a final file size of around 50 Ks. And in the kind of a full size, uh, we have around seven megabytes, which is still not crazy. So let's just go ahead and export this photo. When we, once we have selected all of the um, all of the export recipes that we want to, uh, we make sure that everything is set up correctly. We can just click on export. There you go. And we will normally get this process. Uh, in this case, it was so fast that it wouldn't even like uh, uh, it wouldn't even like let me see the progress bar. Uh, also, this is new and it's a nice um, user experience improvement. If you allow the notifications, it will just let you know once the export has been completed and then it's really handy. You can just click on show and it will directly open the folders where it went. So for example, in my desktop here, I have a panorama. Like this would be the, the full uh, thing. And here in Instagram, I would have the one that is with compression and with a lower um, size. So that would be basically the process recipes in a nutshell. Hope you caught everything. And there is, I think, one last question for now. Um, this will be the last one I'm taking unless anything else shows up soon. So if you have any more questions, uh, just keep posting them in the chat. So it was around, I think that you are meaning the color balance tool. So I'm just going to put it here so we can see better what is going on. You can see that uh, the interface in Capture One is fully customizable and you can just uh, hide and move around and bring back and whatnot. So I really like Capture One and it's one of the main, this is one of the main reasons. So the color balance tool uh, just basically works uh, for color grading just like any other mm, tool in color grading for video mostly. So we have different uh, options. I normally use a three-way because it allows me to see everything in detail. So I'm just going to reset this tool you can see the chains here. And basically what this tool allows us to do is to set uh, different color tints for shadows, midtones, and highlights. And it's a very nice one and because it's really intuitive to use it to work with color. So one thing that works a lot and it works really well, it's just to play around with complementary colors, for example. So this is why before I did, before I did like 
blue to the shadows like if you want to um, have like a workflow of how this works normally i would just go like all the way to the edge uh, with this little point and you can see that the more to the edge i go the harder the effect becomes and i just did it for picking like my tone and then i go around the wheel and until i see something that works for me so this kind of tone will do it for me or we can go a little bit cooler or maybe let's just try something different maybe let's just try like a little bit more on the purple side of things and once that i have chosen my tone i can just go down on the left slider and just increase it gradually if i go too far it's going to have a effect that's going to be too strong but if i stay lower than half or a third it's going to have a nice effect it's going to cool down the shadows really nicely and then uh, otherwise it will be like too cold I can just uh, compensate with the highlights with a complementary color that's going to be the one right on the other opposite side of the wheel so it would go over here up to the yellow greenish tones and I think that is a nice combination if you're not sure you can always as I did before go around the wheel and choose something that would work for you I think that the yellow is working on pretty nicely but this is too much so again going down all the way and increasing gradually just like so i think it's a nice color grading and i think it um it allows you to um kind of work a little bit with the color atmosphere otherwise if you leave it just like that you're really up to what uh, how the camera is capturing the colors which might be really accurate but it might not be uh, able to tell the story that you want to tell with a photo so I personally like to go towards more like um, melancholic kind of colors and desaturated kind of colors and to this way to play around with the complementary colors it works really nicely for me. There is also a little like final contrast slider so we can do it like if we want extra contrast or we want to like um, lift up the shadows but in a like more uniform way then it's a nice option to do it from here too. In this case just going down just a little bit more and there you would have the before and the after. I hope that is clear for now. I'm not sure if we have any more questions. I don't think so. So um, if that was all for today, uh, just wanted to thank you again for bearing with me the whole session. I hope it was interesting. I hope it was useful. And we at Capture One, we all hope that, we, that you will like the new features. We are very, very excited specifically about the ATR and Panorama merge because as I said in the beginning, it's something that you've been requesting for a long, long time. So I'm not even sure what you're going to be requesting now. So you will have to give it some imagination. And we are, of course, always really happy to hear all of your feature requests. And this is what keeps the software evolving. And this is what makes me so excited about it. Um, I'm really also happy because it's my fourth release and Capture One is the first uh, year in a row that I'm doing this presentation. And it just like it became like a nice end of the year tradition for me. So I'm really happy to be able to share this uh, new and exciting features with you again. So um, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for Wex. Thanks to Tiffany for being on the chat with me. Um, it was really really exciting. And um, we are preparing some new exciting uh, live sessions with Wex uh, for the next year. That's going to be uh, actually just in three weeks. Um, so yeah. Uh, for the new year, we're preparing a lot of new interesting live sessions. The next one coming up is a workflow for wedding photographers. So if there's any uh, wedding photographers out there watching this session, we have you in mind. And we would like to create and share with you this full uh, workflow for file management, editing, batch editing, uh, setting up your process recipes as you want to, to save lots of time. So that's something that we'll be covering in January 2022. Um, other than that, as I said, thanks a lot. Uh, I wish you all a Merry Christmas, if that's not too early to say, and a really nice end of the year and a great beginning of the new one. So thank you all guys. Really, really exciting to be here with you today and see you next time. Bye.